In the middle of the first century, there was a young man who grew up in a household where he was, for the most part, well taken care of. His needs were met. Now, his needs were not met by his mother. His needs were not met by his father. They were met by his master, for he was a slave. Now, slavery in the first century is not like, was not like the slavery that we are accustomed to. We tend to look at the Bible through uh, the lens of the 20th and 21st century. And so we infer our own experiences onto what we read. And so when we read about slavery, we naturally will apply the ideas that we have grown up with, that we have learned regarding slavery, we'll apply them to uh, what we read. But slavery was not like what we know of in the first century. Uh, slavery in the first century was not based on race. It was not fueled by hatred. Slavery in many cases, was a step up in a way of life for many people. Slavery in the first century was more of a fulfilling of an obligation than anything else. For example, I was reading this past week an example uh, that might have occurred in the first century where a young man who might be 20 years old might sell himself to a Roman officer. He would go to that Roman officer and say, Sir, I see you're having some trouble managing your household. I will sell myself to you for 10 years to serve you. I would belong to you. You would own me for 10 years legally. And I will serve your household. And that Roman officer may do that and say, all right. And in the course of that 10 years, that Roman officer could provide that slave with an education, with a wage. Where at the end of that 10 years, when that young man turns 30 and he fulfills his 10-year obligation, would then be set free. And he might even be better for it. Now, I don't want you to think that this is the way it always was, because there are certainly cases where slavery, uh, where owners treated their slaves very badly. But it wasn't based on race. It was just the person. So slavery today or yesterday uh, in our country is a little different than the first century. And so here we've got a young slave. And he's fulfilling his obligation to his master. And one day, the slave, while doing some cleaning, comes across a wooden box, a small wooden box. And he's never seen this box before. And he opens it. And inside, maybe he finds some money and some jewels. Something clicks inside. I don't know what it is, but he decides to take it. And he hides it. Maybe he's thinking he'll add it to the stash and he's free, he'll have more money. I don't know. But the owner discovers, the master discovers that his money and jewels are missing. And the slave learns that the master knows. And now there's a hunt for this money and for these jewels. And the slave, he gets nervous and so he flees. He runs away. He runs by night. He hides by day. And he ends up in one of the larger cities. And while he's in this city, he meets an evangelist. And this evangelist shares with him the story of Jesus. And this intrigues this slave. Yet he still does not feel comfortable about revealing who he is or his background 
to this evangelist. And after a day or two, the evangelist tells the slave, I want you to come. I want you to meet somebody. I want to introduce you to someone who can tell you even more. And so the slave agrees. And the evangelist takes him to a prison. And now the slave is beginning to think, oh, I've been caught. They know who I am. But he still goes along with this evangelist. And this evangelist leads him to a cell. And the slave just knows that the cell door is going to open and he's going to be pushed in and he's going to be held prisoner. But when the door is opened and he looks inside, he sees an old man sitting there chained, writing utensils sitting around him on the floor. The prisoner invites the slave in and the prisoner begins to talk to the slave about Jesus. Talking about this man who healed. This man who performed miracles. This man who died on a cross and was resurrected so that we might have eternal life. And the slave listens all night and into the morning. And by the time morning comes, the slave, he's in tears and he gives his life to Christ. And so the prisoner continues to mentor the slave. The slave comes back day after day and learns and grows. And before long, the prisoner begins to send the slave out on errands, maybe even delivering a letter or two. And then the slave gets to a point where he feels he can open up and he can share about what he has done and where he has come from. And when he does this with the prisoner, the prisoner shows compassion. The prisoner sympathizes, but the prisoner also tells him that he must go back to the master. He must be reconciled. He must fulfill his obligation. Of course, the slave is very nervous about that because, you know, he knows what can happen. Like I said, slavery was a little different in the first century, but... Masters still owned their slaves legally. In the Roman Empire, the rules relaxed. There was no oversight committee. So a master, an owner of a slave, could do whatever they wanted to the slave. He could treat him well and, and give him wages and educate him, or he could beat him and torture him. And this slave knew that the penalty for, for stealing could mean death. But the prisoner says, no, you've got to go. And so the prisoner asks him, who is your master? And the slave says, my master's name is Philemon. To which the prisoner's eyes widen with excitement. And he says, I know Philemon. Now that's the gist, a little embellished, but that's the gist of the book of Philemon. Philemon is an obscure little letter in the New Testament found between the books of Titus and between the book of Hebrews. If you ask many believers where the book of Philemon was located, they might not even be able to tell you if it was in the Old Testament or the New Testament. It's a book that we do not often read. It's not often quoted from. It's a, it's a book that we really do not use much. And in fact, I was watching a video presentation on Philemon uh, this morning. And uh, the uh, pastor on there, the educator on there, said that Philemon was nothing more than theological, not fluff, theological uh, bunk, is that what he said? I can't remember now. But whatever it was he said, it was basically there was nothing there. There was nothing in Philemon worth our time. And I really disagree. Timothy tells us that all Scripture is God-breathed. It's useful for inspiration. It's useful for rebuking. It's useful for teaching. And that includes Philemon. 25 verses. 335 Greek words. 445 English words. Depending on which translation you're using. Philemon is a very powerful letter that talks to us. That teaches us. 
that shows us about our relationship with God, about our relationship with Christ, about forgiveness, and about reconciliation. It, these 25 verses are very powerful. And we're going to spend the next couple of weeks, not real long, because it is a short book, but we're going to spend a few weeks looking at the book of Philemon. And this series, if it goes the way I hope it goes, is going to be more of a teaching series rather than a preaching series. I'm going to share with you some information um, beginning this morning. I want us to approach Philemon um, like I tell my Bible study class and Sunday school class, I use a word called uh, exegetical studies. I want us to approach Philemon uh, with an attitude of, of an exegesis, and that is when you take verses and you study verses, you study sections of a particular book. And I want to do that over the course of the next few weeks with Philemon. And so we're going to begin with the first few verses in this book. It's the third shortest book of the Bible, written by Paul around 60, 61 AD. This is the only personal letter that we have from Paul. Now when I say that, I mean that, you know, these other letters written by Paul, they're personal, but they're written to churches. This is a letter that is written to a specific per person for a specific purpose. When you read this letter, you can tell that Paul and Philemon, they have a relationship. So they know each other. They have a background, a history together. This is a plea on the part of Paul. The letter begins with the typical salutation. If you look at the ancient letters, you'll see that they begin, they have a certain form to them. And Paul's letters are no exception. The letters begin with uh, the identification of the author. You see that here in Philemon. Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus and Timothy, our brother, tells you who the author is. You look at, uh, go back to 2 Timothy, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God. Look at 1 Timothy. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the command of God our Savior and Christ Jesus our hope. The author identifies himself in a letter and often accompanies that with some sort of a title. Paul uses many times. And the titles that he uses depends upon who he's speaking to and how he wants to present himself to those whom he is writing. So in the case of Timothy and some of the other letters that he writes, many times he has to defend his apostleship. A lot of questions regarding Paul's authenticity regarding his apostleship. And so many times Paul in his letters identifies himself as an apostle of Christ by the will of God, by the command of God in order to defend his apostleship. Well, here in Philemon, he's writing for a different purpose. He's writing on behalf of Onesimus, a slave. And so he puts himself in the category of Onesimus. He refers to himself as a prisoner. And the Greek word here used for prisoner means bound. It means to be in chains. So he's talking about being a, physical, a, a literal prisoner <coughs> for Christ. A better way to look at that might be Paul, a prisoner because of Christ Jesus. He was in prison because of his, of his preaching the gospel, of him sharing the gospel of Christ Jesus. And so he identifies himself, Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus and Timothy, our brother. <clears throat> he was subtly appealing to Philemon in this one verse. He was subtly trying to get across to Philemon, look, if I can endure the physical punishments that comes from following Christ, surely you can do the easier thing that I am asking you to do, and that is to receive Onesimus back with love, to receive him back and treat him as you would treat me. All right, so who's it written to? It's written to Philemon, our dear friend and our fellow worker. The words, our dear friend there, if 
you would bring that into the 21st century, it would come across as BFF. My best friend forever. That's what Paul is trying to get to Philemon. Philemon, you are my best buddy, Philemon. We're close, you're my man. And he's a fellow worker, which means <clears throat> his deeds mean it matches faith. He is a hard worker. He's one who spreads the gospel. He's one who opens his home to the church. He's a wealthy man. He, he, he has a church in his home. <clears throat> he owns slaves. And somewhere along the line, he came uh, to Christ because of Paul. And I believe I read, I think Acts chapter 19 uh, is a reference point to when Paul spent two years at Ephesus. And many believe that that's when Philemon probably came to know Christ through Paul is in that journey of Paul there. And if you read on, it's not just to Philemon here, but it's also to Aphia, who is our sister, which implies that she is a believer as well, a Christian as well, and also Archippus, which is uh, a fellow soldier, which once again goes to someone who is in the trenches, someone who is doing work for Christ. And then he also addresses it to the church that meets in their home. And many scholars believe that he addresses it to Aphia and to Archippus and to the church because he's hoping that they will hold Philemon accountable. That when they hear this letter and they see what Paul is wanting Philemon to do, that they would hold Philemon accountable to Paul's words. Now, Aphia was probably uh, Philemon's wife and Archippus is believed to be their son. And Archippus is actually mentioned back in Colossians 4.17 when Paul says, tell Archippus, see to it that you complete the ministry that you have received in the Lord. So there is some connections there, a uh, crossover from book to book. So, Paul is wanting to send Onesimus back to Philemon to seek his master's forgiveness. And we know that that takes great risk. We talked about that earlier because slaves were punished for things like that. But as we're going to read, we're going to see that Paul uh, tells Philemon to put whatever it is that Onesimus owes on my account. I'll pay for it. Now that's a big statement. Earlier I mentioned how there is so much stuff in Philemon. And one of the things that I hope we can pull out of this book is the message of forgiveness, of the message of Christ taking our penalty for us, being in our place. And if you look at Philemon, you'll see there is a parallel between what Jesus did and what Paul does. If you look at the characters in this book and you see Philemon and you see Onesimus and you see uh, Paul and you see Onesimus as, or uh, Philemon as the master and you see Onesimus as the slave and their relationship has been severed and then you see Paul come in as the intercessor, as the mediator, who attempts to reconcile that broken relationship between master and slave. Paul steps in as the mediator. You look at that and you apply it to what we know about Christ, you're seeing the exact same thing. You're seeing God as the master and you're seeing us as his servant. You're seeing living in a broken world where our relationship with God has been severed. And then you see Jesus coming in as our mediator attempting to reconcile our relationship with our master. We're going to see that what it comes down to is a choice. Onesimus has a choice to take the letter that Paul gives him and return to his master for reconciliation. Or he has the choice to walk out of that prison and run. We have a choice to accept the gift that Christ gives us and to be reconciled to our Father or to take that message and to turn and to run. 
we're going to see some very powerful messages through this short little book. And so I encourage you not to just read it once, not to read it twice, but to read it over and over and over as we go through this series and to allow God to open your eyes and your minds to the scriptures, the words that are here, and the words that are behind the words, because that's what we're going to be doing. We're going to be looking at the words behind the words, and we're going to pull out of this what I hope is going to be a very powerful message for all of us. So this morning, I invite you to reflect on the teachings and the words that God has placed on your heart today and your minds. Maybe he's placed on your hearts this past week. I don't know. I don't know how he's working in your life, but I know he is working in your life in some way. And so I invite you to respond to whatever it is he has given you, whatever it is he has placed on your heart. We'll turn to hymn number 408, I Surrender All. 408, I Surrender All. And I invite you to stand. We'll sing verse 1. And I invite you to reflect and to commit this morning as we praise God. Verse 1, 408, I surrender all. 